Good afternoon and welcome everybody at this ninth session of the Green Post Corona Talks, organized by the Green European Foundation in partnership with the Flemish think tank Oikos. I'm Dirk Holemans, I'm a co-president of the foundation and host of these talks. And as we learned during previous sessions, people from all Europe are following these sessions via live stream on Facebook. And this is of course great. And you can make, to make it an internet, interactive session, you can post your questions on Facebook or use Twitter. And then uh, I can see the questions in my chat box and we'll ask them in the second part, the Q&A part of this webinar. Uh, in this uh, ninth session, we will discuss the prospects for Europe in the wake of this crisis. And on the one hand, we, for instance, see member states competing with each other on the global market for, to buy instant masks, which is not really an example of cooperation. And uh, on the other hand, we see the European Commission trying to build a common response to the crisis, which was already the case and is connected to it, for instance, the Green Deal. And so, yeah, a lot of questions, of course. Uh, is this crisis a rerun of the previous Eurozone crisis? What about civil society? How are uh, associations of citizens organizing themselves? And also what, for instance, is the relevance of the Conference on the Future of Europe announced by the Commission for Citizens. And in order to discuss this wide range of issues, we have two great speakers today. First, we have Shreko Hogvat. He's a Croatian philosopher, wrote many books and also a member of DiEM25. Next, we have Marie Toussaint. She's from France and a member of the Greens EFA group in the European Parliament. We will start with Shreko and listen how he sees the current crisis and what this means for the prospects of the European Union. Shreko, I give you happily the floor. Uh, so thanks a lot uh, for, for having me here. Um, well, wh where to start? Uh, first of all, I think you mentioned that uh, the question whether this is a rerun of a previous crisis. Uh, I think it's definitely not a rerun of a previous crisis. Uh, it's nothing alike uh, the previous crisis, if you are thinking about the previous crisis of 2007-2008. Uh, of course, there are parallels, but I think we are finding ourselves in an unprecedented historical situation. Uh, I think uh, in the next years, I don't think we even have a decade uh, uh, to stop the disintegration of, of the European Union. Uh, you know, when we founded DiEM25, the Democracy in Europe movement, uh, uh, we gave it the name 2025, uh, and we start a presumption by a basic thesis, which is that if the European Union uh, won't democratize, it will disintegrate. Uh, but today, I must say, as a co-founder of DN25, that this seems already a bit optimistic. You know, I don't think that we have time until 2025. Uh, you know that the next European elections are coming and so on. Uh, but I think this is a very distant future. Uh, while on the other hand, we are accelerating uh, towards this dystopian future. Uh, what do I mean by that? Uh, uh, you know, if, if you just look at the reactions of the European Commission uh, and the main institutions of the European Union, including Frontex, uh, to the coronavirus crisis, uh, you will see that uh, uh, basically a sort of disintegration is already happening. Uh, what I fear most is that unlike the crisis which led Greece uh, uh, to the situation in which Greece is today. You know, there is still a humanitarian crisis going on in Greece, not just with the refugees, but inside of Greece as well. Uh, and you remember the reaction uh, uh, of the so-called Troika, a name which is not spoken so often anymore, uh, but I think it should be spoken because you can see that now the IMF is again back in many countries and so on. And the reaction during that crisis was more privatizations, more austerity, uh, bailing out uh, uh, the big players and so on. And this is something what is happening today as well, but it is happily happening on the whole European level. You know, this is not anymore just pigs, Portugal and so on, uh, but you now have also Italy, you know, one of the one of the very important countries of the Eurozone, you have Spain, and you can see also what is happening in Germany and in many other countries. So I think we are facing an unprecedented crisis. Uh, uh, just look what's happening in the United States. I think it's impossible to talk about the future of Europe without talking about the future of the world, uh, which then includes also the United States and what is happening now 
uh, uh, which is not just the coronavirus crisis, you know. During the last months, I think many of us uh, have been occupied by the coronavirus crisis. We were trying to find ways out of this crisis. We were, of course, also at DM25, like you, criticizing uh, the Green New Deal by the European Commission, which is not a Green New Deal at all. Uh, but I think now we have to go a step further. You know, even this kind of situation where I'm looking to you through the screen and basically all what I see here is a green light uh, and the dot, which is my camera from, 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 from my computer. Uh, this brings me to, to a thesis which now McLean, Klein recently had, which is uh, that besides the Green New Deal, we have to start talking about the Screen New Deal as well, uh, because it's connected. What you have with the European Commission's Green New Deal, you, can, you have this kind of uh, uh, utopia that technology can bring the Green New Deal and that more market can bring the Green New Deal. Uh, uh, but what we what we witness today is that precisely those who have led to the crisis, uh, fossil fuel companies, big airline companies, and so on, are being bailed out. Uh, while at the same time, we have something which I think all of us have to focus much more uh, is the screen New Deal in the sense that we have a rapid acceleration of uh, onlineization of of life. Uh, not just, you know, professional life, but private life and so on. Now, of course, you can say this is for the privileged classes like us, uh, 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 who can still talk through the screens and are at the moment not at the streets. Uh, but I think this is also a very important, uh, profound change that is happening. Of course, we could talk about Shoshana Zubov, surveillance capitalism and so on. Uh, but what I'm most interested in is uh, how to think and how to react to all these uh, developments which are happening at the same time. So you have a biological uh, uh, event, you have uh, to then bring us to, to, to biopolitics. At the same time, you have a screen new deal, which means that you have, besides the biological uh, 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 effects of a virus, which then change society, psychology, and so on, uh, uh, you also have uh, this technological development, which is very important. And at the same time, what you can see is that uh, the two biggest of the existential threats, not only for humanity, but for the planet itself, are still here. You know, they didn't disappear. On the one hand, it's the climate crisis, and on the other hand, uh, uh, it is the nuclear threat, uh, which never disappeared, and it didn't disappear after the Cold War. Uh, so in this kind of situation, where you have a virus, uh, you have more austerity, you have bailing out the rich, uh, you have uh, uh, structural racism, uh, not just in the United States, but inequalities inside of our societies, where you have a weaponization of a class war and where, where, where you have a further division between the center and the periphery of the European Union, uh, a, a much bigger division than ever before. You could have seen it, you know, during the coronavirus crisis, in which way uh, uh, cheap labor force from Romania, Serbia and other countries uh, or South European countries were treated, you know, uh, uh, and this is something to stay. This is going to go much deeper. And I'm afraid, I'm not afraid, I, I'm completely certain that the current establishment or the deep establishment of the European Union doesn't have a response to it. Uh, what will start happening as the effect of it might be something what is happening in the United States. You know, even this, what is happening in the United States uh, 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 is something which I think we saw it coming, but many people denied it, you know. Uh, and even today, if you, I don't know whether you read uh, uh, this European commissioner, I don't know his name. Uh, I'm not so familiar with, with the Brussels uh, uh, landscape in the sense of the names of commissioners, but I, I, this caught my eye uh, because a commissioner recently said that uh, uh, what is happening in the United States, the militarization of police, uh, uh, this can't happen in Europe, in the European Union. And I think this is completely untrue. You know, it reminds me of this book which Sinclair Lewis uh, 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 published, which the name was It Can't Happen Here. It was published in 1935, and it's about fascism. Same way I think the European establishment is putting a blind eye uh, on, the, on the situation, uh, which is all rapidly accelerating. You know, it's not just Hungary, uh, uh, like the bad apple of the European Union. It's everywhere. And very soon, I think we might also be facing a situation similar to, to the United States. Uh, I'm sorry if this is dark. Uh, uh, and maybe just to finish with a more 
Uh, well, I hate optimism, so I cannot give you an optimistic note. I think optimism is naive and dangerous, uh, but a more hopeful uh, uh, ending of this. So on the one hand, we have this situation, which I think is not like 2007, 2008 or 1968, which is the parallel now with the United States. It is all of this combined, you know, it is the Spanish flu combined, it is the Cold War combined, or the nuclear age, climate crisis, it is all this. So any parallel today, I think, is not sufficient anymore. But what you can see in this situation uh, on the streets, uh, not just you know, all over the United States, uh, but all across Europe, it's, it's a major historic movement, uh, uh, which is now kind of... Uh, uh, combining all the different aspects and different struggles, which in a sort of, you know, COVID-19 served as a sort of apocalypse in the, in the original Greek meaning of the unveiling revelation of something and then revealed the structural violence of global capitalism. Uh, and I think what you have now after a short slowdown, you know, when the skies were visible and some people who were happy enough to be in self-isolation were in self-isolation, after this slow slowdown, I think we have now a rapid acceleration which can lead in all directions. Uh, and that gives me hope uh, because for, for, for the first time, I think uh, uh, during a long period, you can see that a planetary event is happening. Uh, of course, it might end up like the Arab Spring and so on. I've written about it as well. Uh, but I think our role today, whether you know you are in the European Parliament, you're an activist, an NGO, a father, a mother, a child, is to join these movements uh, and to build a different future. Because if we don't do it today, tomorrow it will be too late. And I think 2025 is also a bit too late already. So I stop here because I, I, I'd love to hear from Marie and also to, well, to discuss. Sorry, I didn't prepare a lecture or something. I hated. No, 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 no. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. I think this is also a really clear introduction and, and uh, very uh, happy to learn your perspective on what's happening now. And of course, uh, we're also very, very interested in the view of Marie Toussaint, who is, well, as member of European Parliament, of course, in one of the core institutions of the European Union, also uh, very close uh, observing what the other parts, like the European Commission, are proposing. And then, of course, secondly, assessing this from the critical point of view from the Greens. So, uh, Mary, I now give you the floor for this second perspective on the crisis and Europe. Okay, thank you a lot, Dirk. Uh, thank you to the Green European Foundation for inviting us. And thank you for to to Shashko to be here with us and discuss. This is really important that we have different political families, different perspectives in the discussion on what we need to do from now on. And um, I do share several things with Shashko. Maybe just to begin with, but um, Shreshko was talking about the movement, the social movement against racism that is burning throughout the world following the death of um, the murder of George Floyd. Uh, but of course, we also have this um, police violence in the EU, and we should not forget that there are some families that are fighting to get justice um, for the members of the families who were killed uh, because of um, altercations with, with the police. And we should be really careful because we don't have the same violence story as the US, but we do have a violence story as well. Um, and, and this is also something that we need to keep fighting against um, in the coming years. And it's not acceptable that in the 21st century, we still have these discussions on um, discriminations against different types of, of people. We should be uh, um, a continent, a project where no difference, no discrimination can happen. And this is a real important point. If we build a better future, there's something racism that we need to get rid of and we need to be really volunteers on that issue. Um, to get back to the crisis uh, as itself, I really do believe that this crisis is unique, but it can repeat itself and it will most certainly repeat uh, in the coming years. Why is this crisis unique? Well, because it it's first of all an ecological crisis we're not sure yet completely of how the covid 19 um happened to humanity but what we know for sure is that this kind of viruses the, zo the zoonosis 
are getting more and more numerous and stronger because as long as we destroy the environment and the habitat of animals, the viruses that live in the animals jump quicker and faster on uh, human beings. And then because of our system, um, this ecological crisis becomes a health crisis, which becomes a social crisis because we live in a world where everything, everyone, but especially the objects, the products, um, travel all around the world so that it cannot be contained in some place specifically. And it's not because only of the humans crossing borders, it's also because of the product crossing, crossing borders because of globalization, then the virus spreads really quick. And then it also becomes an economical crisis because we have to stop the economy to stay home. Um, and we don't know how to protect the people and especially the people in need from the impacts of this crisis. So we saw in the EU territory the fact that, well, the poorer people were hurt the most by the crisis because they already have diseases that are linked to poverty and that, they, that are environmental diseases like diabetes, for instance. Um, and we also had the lower, lower classes going to work. That the people that could work in offices, we could stay home. And this is a huge difference. And we also noticed some episodes of um, hunger coming back in the EU, getting reinforced in the, uh, in the EU because of this crisis, which I repeat was at first ecological, then became health crisis, then become, uh, became social, and that is now economic an economic crisis. So the fact that is that this crisis comes of the fact that our economy is not under control. We do not make sure that the economy respects the planetary boundaries, the environment, neither that it respects the social needs. Um, this is the donut theory of Kate Rowolf, where what we need to do right now is not to have um, the neoliberal point of view where the economy just directs itself, but now we should be really firm in the fact that we take the economy, we take the finance, we take capitalism, and we put it back under human control, which it should have always been like this. So the first lesson for Europe, um, to, to my opinion, is that it's urgent to put an end to this economic model that we had just before the COVID-19 crisis. And this is not what we see right now. We see attempts to feed back uh, the system with still a lot of money going to fossil fuels, for instance. Um, but we really need to reorientate the economy and put it at the service of the people and of the planet. And one of the first things that we need to do is to behave, to be exemplary within the European Union, to really fight against climate change. And this is one of the um, efforts that we make to push for the climate law to be really ambitious, but also to push for the strategy on biodiversity to be really ambitious. And it's also about our relations to the rest of the world. And we can't keep having free trade agreements with the entire world if we want to grow our own food. Imported deforestation, and um, just to let you know, but the EU is a major driver of deforestation around the world because of our imports, especially soya, but it's also the, the same for palm oil or for cocoa. We have a lot of consumption here in the EU that is destroying the planet everywhere around, and the, that is responsible for the violation of rights of people that are also quite um, exposed to the COVID-19, and I'm thinking especially of the indigenous people who are crying for help uh, right now, uh, and they are absolutely not responsible, neither for climate change, for the loss of biodiversity, or for the COVID-19 crisis. Um, that also means that we need to refund our system of solidarity, the way we envisage solidarity. And I will, I will talk about two points there. First of all, between the member states. Um, we have a common market, but we don't really have a common um, budgetary policy, a common economic finance. Um, and the first, uh, the, the proposal that just was that was just made by the Commission is a first step towards the finalization of the European Union, towards a federalist European Union, uh, with um, a mutualization of a part of the debts and also with the um, will to raise uh, proper resources on resources. So it's a first step 
but it's really not enough. And as we're seeing the European Union falling apart, it's the Brexit, but it's also, of course, uh, what ha what's happening in Hungary or in Poland. Uh, Shreko talked a bit about that. Um, as we see the European Union exploding or imploding, we really need to, um, yeah, to, to take not only one step, but 10 steps in the direction of a real European uh, solidarity. The second thing, of course, is our internal solidarity with the people, among the people, and by the people. We need to access to health, and we know that austerity measures have been uh, have had a huge impact on health, but also on education. Um, we also need to have a minimum income for the people, whatever the form that it could take, but we need to have some funds uh, for solidarity to refuse that people live under a certain level of financial resources. And at last, we need to have a real policy on environmental justice. Nobody's talking about that right now, but it's as I told you, there are some people that are more um, subject of environmental diseases. Um, that live uh, next to big factories that are polluting, uh, that lives right to next to highways. Um, and it's the same people that are always also getting the diseases, the diseases first, like the COVID-19 one. Um, and maybe as a last point, I would say that for to reach all of these goals, we would need to reform the economy as well. And a recovery plan can be interesting because um, we, we need to support the economy, of course, and the activities. It's also good because we didn't have enough money for the Green Deal. That's a bit like Shreko, Shreko said, while saying that the Green Deal was not ambitious enough anyways. Um, but it's good that now we are able to push for the money to be put on the table to ensure that we have the real transition. It's still not there yet, and we need to go and to move away further and forward on that issue. Darren, I would quote three points and then I will stop uh, with this first uh, intervention. But first, we need to reform the European Central Bank. We need to make the money a common good. Uh, we need to be able to choose as citizens if we create money or if we don't create money and if we create money for what goals. And what is urgently needed is to allow the transition, the green transition to be made. So we need to dare creating money to speed the transition with the economic thinking in the European Union up to that point. The second thing is that we have to accept to withdraw from certain domain of activities. I'm thinking of aviation, I'm thinking of um, car transportation, uh, truck transportation, and we can talk about many other activities where we human uh, are doing more harm than good to the planet, but also to ourselves. And this is a gesture of humility from the humankind to accept that we need to um, yeah, withdraw from certain domain of activities and to be a bit more cautious in the way we engage in activities. Not every production, not every consumption is worth it. And the last point is that uh, we, of course, need to invest, to invest in the green activities, to invest, uh, first of all, in agriculture, not like, uh, not only with digital solutions. Digital is not the problem and the, the, is not the solution to everything, but it's human activities that is the solution. And a good agriculture uh, and agroecology a uh, policy could also help create a lot of jobs. It's of course also in the renovation of buildings, in energy efficiency, in renewables, in the protection of nature. We have a lot of domain where we could invest and create jobs that are good for the people and good for the planet, and also guarantee that we have um, yeah, the basic needs. That um, to me, this crisis just shows that all the ecological, the ecologist proposals made this last year are uh, good and legitimate, and that we really could enter to this crisis uh, with green policies. Um, it would also need to change the treaty, um, and I'm fighting for an environmental treaty to be adopted at the European Union level. For the moment, it's not on the table, but I hope that with the Conference of the Future of Europe, we can put this at least uh, and at last on the table. Okay, thank you for this uh, very inspiring uh, first perspective. Uh, Maybe, uh, Shreko, I can invite you to give a reaction either on the global uh, perspective, Marie, 
uh, made or on some of the three points he made. Uh, I noted reform from the European Central Bank. Second, accept to withdraw from certain economic activities. Three, invest in green activities. So uh, please uh, give your reaction. Yeah, uh, look, I, I could also agree on the point that uh, we obviously need to radically rethink the European Central Bank. Uh, you also mentioned uh, universal basic uh, income. Uh, we at DiEM25, uh, as soon as the crisis started, and you know this talk about the euro bonds started and so on, we published a three-point plan as well, uh, where uh, European Central Bank is included. Uh, but instead of uh, uh, universal basic income, we talk about uh, the universal basic dividend. Uh, the difference is that you don't take, I'm, I'm simplifying, of course, but you can check it on the DM website. Uh, you don't take the money from taxes, uh, but you actually uh, take the money from dividends from the big companies. Uh, so that's, I think, the small difference. But uh, we came to a calculation that uh, by using the existing institutions, you could give around 2,000 euros per month to each European citizen, uh, which would, of course, uh, make the transition easier, especially in a period where millions of people will lose their jobs. Uh, uh, but I don't see that the current European direction is going in anywhere close to that, you know. Uh, uh, so that's the problem. Uh, you also said that at one point uh, that we have to put capitalism under, under human control, uh, where I agree with many things which you said, but that's one of the things I don't agree uh, because I don't think that capitalism can be put under control. Of course, what you are doing inside of the European Parliament, uh, what uh, uh, many people are doing either in government, uh, governmental positions or, or institutions and so on, uh, at least those of these people who are progressive, uh, is to try to do what is possible to do it today and to to prepare for the future which is uh, uh, coming in the next years. But I think we at the same time need to have a long term perspective, which is, you know, at the point, deal with the things which we can deal with, uh, which I think uh, more and more it will be become, and it always was, but I think if the COVID crisis showed anything is that we also have to rethink uh, not just the, the, the question of the state, uh, but also the question of institutions. Uh, so I think, of course, uh, it, it is, you know, I was always of the position we were even running for the European Parliament, as you know, uh, that we need to try everything we can, you know, that uh, you need to try to do it from inside of the European Parliament, you need to try to do it outside of the European Parliament. Uh, but I think what the COVID-19 crisis showed is that we have to start building institutions, you know, it's not just uh, enough to, to enter institutions and then using, use the existing mechanisms of those institutions, uh, which then very often end up in the long march through the institutions, although, you know, this famous Rudy Duczke saying, although I would prefer a very quick march through the institutions, which would then enable to change the situation radically. Uh, uh, but I think we need to start creating uh, our own institutions. Uh, 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 when I say that, yes, we need to work together on a Green New Deal for Europe. Uh, we need to work together with uh, uh, movements from Canada, United States, Africa, Asia on a global Green New Deal, uh, which would take into consideration colonize the Green New Deal as such, and that technology itself is not a solution, uh, you know, to exchange, uh, 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 to, to remove fossil fuels and have lithium batteries is not a response, it's not an answer uh, as such, because it still relies on the expansion of capitalism and extraction of natural resources in order to get the lithium batteries, you know. Uh, so what I'm saying is, I think we, we, we have the big task to work together, all of us, on a global Green New Deal, which would be, as you said, uh, a just transition, a just new deal, a green new deal. Uh, but without decolonization of it, uh, I think it won't be successful. And without the, the, the necessary criticism of global capitalism, it won't be successful. Uh, 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 you know, ev everyone speaks about, not everyone, at least in, in my circles, about post-capitalism. Uh, uh, and uh, But post-capitalism can be also something much worse than this kind of technological utopia where we will have universal basic income and we will all ride electric bikes, there will be no cars, 
and so on, post-capitalism can also be something much worse. You know, it can be an authoritarian version of a system which won't be capitalism anymore. Even that's possible. Uh, but in any case, I think we have to try to do everything what we can uh, 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 inside the institutions, out, outside of the institutions. But what, what is crucial, and that's what COVID-19 showed, is to start building institutions. Uh, I know this may sound quite apocalyptic, uh, but thanks God I'm not an MEP, so I probably couldn't say that. But uh, uh, I'm just finished the book up, uh, on the apocalypse uh, and uh, one of the point is that already today we have to uh, uh, build such sorts of institutions or even relations between humans which are not these screen relations if you ask me uh, which would be able uh, uh, to create or sustain a sort of society after the total collapse I know this might be similar to what uh, some dudes mainly white male from Silicon Valley are saying, so they either escape to New Zealand or to Mars. Uh, but my point is different. Instead of escaping, there is no escape from this planet. And most likely there is also no escape uh, from an even more, yeah, an even worse climate crisis. And most likely there is also no escape from uh, the pending nuclear threat. Uh, so if we have this in mind, uh, uh, I think then already today uh, uh, we have to start building Society for after the apocalypse. Uh, this is me saying as an author of a book uh, on the apocalypse, and I know it sounds apocalyptic, but that's how I see it now. And I'm sorry if it's if, if it's not really hopeful. So maybe one last point. Okay, no, I stop and I want to hear Marie. Yeah, sorry. Okay, yeah, I think it's interesting to hear Marie that she shares this uh, apocalyptic uh, view, this kind of first. Uh, something very bad has to happen, and then we can, on that, uh, on the ruins of that, build a new society. Uh, I guess this is not the talk of the town in the European Parliament. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't say that exactly because I, I, I'm saying something bad already happened, okay. and it's not COVID nineteen. It already happened. The apocalypse happened already. That's my point. Okay. <laughs> Sorry for that. <laughs> yeah, I. I'm, I'm not an apocalyptic person to just to answer um, and yeah my philosophy is not optimism it's more hope as you said and I believe that as a privileged person I have no right not to be hopeful and not to act in favor of making the situation better for all the people that's also part of the colonization when you're European you know that you've been your ancestors have been the one uh, beginning to destroy our world. So we have even more reasons to you know, deploy a lot of efforts to repair it as much as we can. Um, that, so that, that's my philosophy on that. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's really interesting what you said, Shreshko, and I would answer, I think, um, some of your points. First of all, but um, minimum income, I think it's really interesting to, you know, dig that and I know that we can do it. It's just a matter of political choice. So I'm not denying that, but what I'm afraid about um, in the left movement is that some of the left people, and I'm, I'm not saying you are, but some of the left people still believe in growth, in productivism, and in the fact that the more we produce, the better we'll be able to share. And I think that this is a real um, um, a breakup that we need to do now is that we're producing too much, we're consuming too much. Uh, we have an ecological footprint that is way beyond what we can do. And since colonization, we've been producing for the well-being of the richest people. And we have been, and we or we today have an inheritance of. Uh, a strong uh, society here in the EU, but also in the US, of course, we have this like solid societies with a lot of infrastructures and everything um, that we've been really we've been really building on the exploitation of other people and of the planet. So now we need to, you know, um, ensure that we accept to decrease so that we can um, reimburse our debt to the people and to the planet. And I think that this is really something that needs to be said. Um, it's not about degrowth, because I don't think that's the issue, but degrowth as an ideology, as a goal. It's more about, um, do we accept that, yeah, we ensure the basic needs for everyone, 
but that we degrow from certain sectors and also from you know the richest so you talked about taxes and about dividends and it's a, we, we can i think we can really work in that direction together and this is something that we share actually mm -hmm. um the, the second point about the institutions that you say um that would be more my point but i believe that and and as long as we are minorities in the elections uh, which a cultural minority or a cultural majority but as long as we are not in majority in the existing institutions, at least, we really need to have a social movement. And even if we would be, um, uh, even if we won the elections um, everywhere around in the EU, which would already be great, but we would still need society to be living and strong. And um, I personally keep working within society as well as in the institution because I don't believe that institutions can change the lives of the people if the people are not pushing for it themselves. Um, and I also don't believe that we'll be able to change the institutions um, the way they are made when with the influence of the lobbies and stuff, um, if we don't have a strong civil society. But in mirror of that, in parallel of that, I also don't believe that we can change society if we don't have people that are able to adopt laws in the institutions because even to disintegrate themselves because we ask for a new treaty for the EU or for a new republic in France, for instance, but we need the people that vote those laws. So we need to be, you know, on the two places and those two places need to work together more closely than they do up to that point. Um, I do believe that. And also, um, when we talk about globalizations and stuff, I, I do believe that we need to have nature entering in the political discussion, democratic discussion. We've been denying the rights to vote, um, and even in, even longer the rights of women to vote. And um, you know now we we need to go to the end of democracy where nature uh, can also talk, and we need to find ways to do so. There are some countries that are you know initiating. Um, uh, attempts to take into account the, the voice of nature, but we need to go in the direction of recognizing the rights of nature and, and having also a status and a representation for the global commons at the global level. Um, maybe the third point, and then I will stop there. Um, I, I, I heard myself saying, let's put capitalism under control. Um, I think it's also because it's in English, but of okay. course, when, when I'm saying that we need to respect the planetary boundaries and that we need to respect people's social needs, I don't see how we can do that with capitalism. And for me, there is no opposition between the emergency to act and the destruction of capitalism because it, it goes together. If we act for the planet and for the people, it destroys capitalism as such, you know? Um, and if we destroy capitalism, of course, it won't. There are some systems of domination and of exploitation of the people and of nature outside of capitalism as well. Um, and we need to fight against it uh, also. Um, so this is a real uh, strong fight that we need to do. And of course, it can only be done at the global level. And I think I told you a bit already in, in my intervention about um, colonization processes and how it worked. Um, but it's still happening now. I'm, I'm really, I just want to tell you a story and I will end with that. Um, but in France, we had those colonies and we still have the ultra peripheric regions, as we call them. And for instance, um, they don't have the same rules as on the French territory. France banned uh, oil exploitation in the seas along the territorial seas, the territorial uh, coasts, but we didn't buy it, but we didn't ban it in the ultra peripheric regions. So there are still places where we have extraction, extractive activities in the sea and also on the ground, but the sea is the major difference between France, um, hexagonal France and ultra peripheric regions. But we also have uh, pesticides, for instance, like the chlordecone, which was authorized a, a real long time in, in the ultra peripheric regions. And in many domains, we still policies here and there where we have of course a different kind of color of skin population you know um, and and we need to acknowledge uh, these territories but also the people who are there and who are still fighting battles that really look like um, 
you know the continuity of of uh, the fight against colonization and this is yeah something that um we need to do and this is about a global green new deal uh, i do agree with that um but it's also how do we engage in the fight with the people and this is really important for me there that we lead our fight on our territory and we support the people who are leading their fights uh, in their territories yeah if i may respond directly or uh, because uh, I, I would love to respond to to your first and second point. So the first point was uh, about progress, uh, and the second one was uh, the point about nature and uh, global commons. Uh, and then maybe we can speak about colonization again. Uh, uh, so first of all, regarding uh, progress and growth, uh, if there is anything I despise, it is the term progress, <laughs> uh, which sounds a bit uh, uh, weird from someone who was involved in a process of founding something what we called the Progressive International. Uh, but this progress is referring to something else. Uh, so uh, my problem with the term of progress uh, is mainly philosophically based. Uh, you will remember Walter Benjamin, the great German philosopher, who said that there is no document of civilization which is not at the same time a document of barbarism. Uh, and then, of course, he took the, the famous uh, Angelus Novus uh, painting uh, uh, by Paul Klee and wrote about the Angelus Novus, which is the angel of history, uh, which where we see progress, the angel of history sees just an accumulation and accumulation of ruins, uh, of destruction. Uh, uh, and uh, why is this concept of progress destructive? I think because it is relying on a, on a conception of time, uh, which is a, conce a linear conception of time, a chronology, chronos, from the Greek term, which uh, which precisely describes this kind of linear uh, linear development of history, you know, from Jesus Christ to Donald Trump, for instance, and then it goes like this, you know, or tomorrow, and then the next day after, and so on. Uh, I'm more much more uh, in favor of a different conception of time, uh, uh, which is the time of Kairos, uh, which is the time of a crack uh, inside of what we perceive as normal time. Uh, uh, and this is something what Benjamin was writing about, but it's also something what Carlo Rovelli in his beautiful book, uh, uh, The Order of Time, writes about. So there are commonalities between historical materialism on the one hand and quantum physics. Uh, and I think if, if we still rely on this concept of progress, which is the capitalist concept of progress, uh, we are on a one-way street to not only self-destruction, but destruction of the biosphere, uh, uh, not just nature, but everything what is connected to the planet of Earth, which is also the semiosphere, you know, the, 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 the ability that we talk, uh, the fact that there is something such as history, uh, which won't be there anymore if there are no humans and no one to be a witness to the final catastrophe. Uh, uh, and unfortunately, the capitalist notion of progress is really based on this linear conception of time. Uh, where progress mainly means uh, is where progress is based on expansion, never-ending expansion of capital into all spheres of nature and uh, uh, human daily life, uh, but it's also based on a sort of colonization of time. Uh, you know, I think we have to start thinking, <laughs> I know it's impossible to do it uh, 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 easily, but to think about the concept of time, not just, you know, we don't need just a progressive international which would be spatial, you know, that as you said rightly, we have to work uh, uh, in our countries, uh, 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 you know, on the grassroots level to try to change our societies or even our own neighborhood or our own apartment building or whatever, you know, from the micro local to the national. And as you said, we, at the same time, we have to connect to other movements. Uh, but this is still just the spatial perspective. I think what Greta Thunberg and Fridays for Future uh, uh, introduced, uh, I mean, it already existed in philosophy, of course, from Benjamin to Gunther Andersen and so on, uh, was precisely this time perspective, you know, that what we are trying to do now is actually uh, uh, to run fast in order to the day after tomorrow and to save it from destruction to put it like that uh i don't know one good example is nuclear waste for instance you know how how long will uh plutonium uh, uh you know the half-life of plutonium is twenty-four thousand years for instance <laughs> so it's we have to think in that perspective you know what, what, what will 
be left after the humans, even if there are no humans, and what kind of effects will, will it have on, on the planet? And in this sense, and I come back here to, to your second point about nature, I think, you know, some of the theories uh, uh, um, uh, are a bit naive or even quite optimistic. I know that uh, uh, a great figure, uh, a great theorist, uh, James Lovelock, uh, recently published a book, you know, the author of the Gaia thesis, uh, 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 published a book which is called uh, uh, which is aiming uh, so that instead of the Anthropocene, uh, we we would start using a new term, which is the Novocene, and his main thesis, which I think is it all also already existed, you know, in, in the last hundred years of philosophy at least, uh, that we are re reaching something what is what he is calling the Novocene, which means the merging between technology and nature, you know, so that you will have a kind of cyborgs, uh, and that the humans perhaps were just something what is. It was just, you know, a shortcut between nature coming to the stage of technological uh, uh, development. But I think this is quite naive because I don't think that uh, with the current eschatological and existential threats, uh, uh, I think we don't have so many years even to build this kind of utopia. It's just another side of the same coin and the other side is, you know, escapes to Marx, Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos and so on. So to come to your second point and then I, I, I stop. Uh, which is about nature, I fully agree. Uh, uh, but I think, and, and, and I think, yeah, the, the concept of commons is, is really useful uh, because uh, 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 it shows in which way uh, uh, nature itself, but not only nature, also emotions. I mean, this, what we are doing now, it, it involves some sort of emotions, although there is a screen, although this is a very alienated situation, uh, but even emotions are being, being colonized by capital. You know, this is transmitted on Facebook, we are using this or that, everyone is using all these technologies by a few big companies from Silicon Valley, which are not paying taxes in Europe and so on, uh, but it also affects emotions. So I think instead of just talking about the global commons, which a sort of planetary commons, uh, which wouldn't just include nature, like, you know, in the sense of natural resources, you cannot privatize water, you cannot privatize the oceans and so on, uh, but it would also include emotions, if you want. I didn't develop this further, but Eva Illouz was re re writing about it, about emotional capitalism, but it would also include time. You know, time itself as a sort of commons, you know, the time we have, or the time which is, which, which is still remaining. Uh, I think that's that's, that should be perceived as commons, you know, the fact that uh, uh, most of the uh, companies or leading governments in the world have a very short time frame where they just want to accumulate more power and then push their own interests through electoral politics. Uh, I think this time, precisely this concept of time, this concept of progress is um, the reason why we are heading towards this one-way street of not only self-destruction, but destruction of the bi biosphere and the semiosphere. Maybe um, there was a question uh, in the chat box on capitalism and talking about uh, global commons, but maybe we can also introduce uh, commons uh, more at uh, either local level or distributed level. Think about media as part of the alternative economy. Would be interested to hear your views on that. So not only the global commons, but also a commons based economy. Yeah, I, I, I was, I'm not surprised that you're asking that because I know that you're acting a lot um, on that issue and it, no, it's really interesting. Um, I, I will answer both things then also to rebound on the, the end of Shriko's uh, Shriko's intervention. I kind of share, I think, everything you said in your last intervention, just to go even a bit further um, on that. I'm, I'm a bit worried, I have to say, about um, the fact that Green people, uh, in a broad sense, are now really calling for science as an ultimate solution. And it goes for me with what you underlined on, on uh, progress, because science is also used to, to go in one direction. And um, Bruno Latour in France showed it in a real uh, clear way as well, that we create the knowledge that we think is useful for our society. And sometimes we've been calling to science to save us, whereas it was destroying us. And it's um, the example of GMOs, the example of nuclear power and all that stuff. So um, I, I, I do believe that we need to you know, acknowledge the fact that even science is a political fight uh, and, and a social movement fight. Um, and, and also within the rights of nature approach, 
who is able to talk on behalf of nature. And this will be a fight as well. Do we believe that it's the scientists only who can talk with regard to what I just said? Or do we believe that it's um, local communities? And we know that under economic pressure, the local communities can also, you know, um, drop out the protection of local or local localized commons. Um, and, and this will be a political fight, and that's also where we need to stand together also with economic and social solutions so that local communities don't have to, to drop out of the protection of their own ecosystems, as we saw, for instance, in Canada with the tar sands or this kind of stuff. Um, and, and on the reverse way, um, I, I also do believe that if we listen to local communities trying to pro protect their own environment, would it be... Um, indigenous people against mining, or would it be people living in the uh, neighborhoods? How would you call that district areas, les banlieues? Um, well, we're protecting, we're fighting to get uh, working elevators in their building to be able to get out and this kind of thing, you know? All those people that we need to be, um, we need to listen to them because they also show us a way to protect the planet. So I'm not sure I was really clear, but um, I was saying basically that we'll still have a political fight in front of us if we, even if we are critical to progress and even if we uh, rely on science and science-based solution and even if we have this rights of nature approach even. Um, but that somehow if we know how to envisage some of the social movements and social fights going on, uh, for the protection of people's rights, then we'll be able to protect the planet better. Um, um, and on the localized commons, I, I think it's really important. I would put health, for instance, within the global commons approach, as well as knowledge. Um, and on the localized uh, commons, we have natural localized commons as well, like forests or some small forests or stuff like this, that, you know, a lake uh, that is a natural local common. And we also have everything that we build in common, um, which is um, yeah, public spaces that we get involved in. Um, uh, and this kind of thing. And, and for me, the approach of commons is really important. It has a lot of implications and um, it's really important to work on this. Um, and it's really about how people get back to power. And that echoes to me um, the Brexit uh, campaign, get back control. I don't think Brexit was getting back in control for the population, but I do think that commons and developing the commons, relying on the commons and trying to rebuild commons everywhere in our house building, in our district, in our city, in our country, uh, and each common has the right level of governance, you know. Um, well, this is getting back in control. And I, I also do believe, as I said in my first point, that it's also a, an orientation that is and will be protecting the planet. Okay, thanks. Maybe uh, Shriko, you can also elaborate on your how commons could be part of this alternative economy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'd first like to, to agree with Marie on her point, uh, which I find really necessary today uh, that, you know, that science is never neutral, you know, science is also always already political. Uh, uh, I mean, Mengele was also a sort of science. <laughs> Come on, so if you say listen to, to science, then it can also, you can listen to, to Mengele and those who are using science. Uh, uh, to do experiments on humans or develop the atomic bomb. You know, this is also science. Uh, um, and the same goes for technology. You know, the, the great French philosopher who died uh, in, two years ago, I think Paul Virillo, uh, his, his whole oeuvre, uh, or how you would say it in French, uh, his whole work uh, was dedicated to this, uh, 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 you know, fact he famously said that the invention of the ship is also the invention of the shipwreck. Uh, so in the same way, you know, the invention of the atomic power or the atomic bomb uh, is also the invention of Hiroshima. Uh, 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 and in that sense, I think in the same way, technology is never neutral and it is always political. In the same goes for science. And you could have seen it precisely in the COVID-19 
uh, situation, you know, uh, in some countries, uh, I don't know how it was in your country, in France or in Belgium, uh, but in some countries, epidemiologists uh, became uh, almost more important than politicians, uh, you know, uh, and constantly it was... Uh, I mean, I, on the one hand, I really like how people made a kind of mental, collective mental jump in the sense of starting to think about health, uh, biology, epidemiology, and so on, uh, which then, of course, very often leads also to, to, to conspiracy theories, 5G, which I also don't like, but I don't think there is any kind of connection with the coronavirus crisis, uh, 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 except that we will spend more time online, so that's why we need more faster internet. Uh, but... Uh, so on the one hand, I think there was a kind of educational mental jump in the same way the, the statues which are now being demolished, being demolished from Leopold II uh, to slave trader in Bristol are an uh, educational jump, which is much uh, a much bigger educational jump than any history book you can read, I think. Uh, uh, but on the other hand, you could have seen that this kind of scientists, virologists and so on beca became a sort of technocratic elite uh, and that science was always political. You know, the fact that I don't know. I was stuck in Vienna during the lockdown. That in Vienna it was uh, uh, you. You still have to wear a ma face mask in supermarkets or, or public transport. I came to Croatia, completely different world. You know, <laughs> no masks, nothing. I mean, but, and we are much better. One of the best countries in Europe. I don't know whether it was pure luck or not, uh, uh, but you can see that even the question of the face mask didn't have to do anything with health issues at the beginning. You know, some countries didn't introduce face masks. Know, something which you have to wear simply because they didn't have face masks. And then one virologist came to television and said, we don't need face masks because of health issues. So this is just a small example how science is always politicized. Uh, uh, and uh, what was, yeah, yeah, what was the, the, the question on on commons and common econ economies? I've written uh, uh, visiting uh, uh, the, the markets in, in Greece after 2005, after the Ohi referendum and the austerity packages, uh, uh, to research how after the potato movement they had this kind of trend of new alternative economies, which I found very interesting. And that's a good example how technology can be used in a positive way, you know, so that you connect small producers together with the consumers and avoid the middlemen or the big supermarkets. Uh, that's what, what's happening and was happening in Greece. The same, I visited cooperatives in, in, in Catalonia, for instance. Uh, uh, they went even a step further, you know, they are, they are experimenting with communes, uh, uh, you know, a kind of merging between cooperatives and communes. I know in France, of course, there is this famous case of Marie Villeneuve uh, Tarnak 9, uh, uh, and I have my criticism of them as well, but I think, uh, uh, you know, they made a good point that if you really want to build a future society, uh, you have to build it here and now. And uh, uh, that means uh, a radical redefinition of uh, uh, consumption, uh, progress, how do we treat other humans, uh, how do we treat the nature, how do we treat other species. Uh, well, these are all big questions and I think we have so much to do because, as you can see, the world is accelerating in a completely different direction currently. Okay, thanks. Uh, and uh, speaking about acceleration also, this one hour for this webinar went very fast and uh, we still have three minutes. And so I first I want to use it to ask Maria last question. You, men you mentioned the Conference on the Future of Europe and, and the importance for uh, involving citizens. So uh what do you think uh how this uh, what could be the potential of this conference um the potential is huge now how how will it work we don't know um but the construction of europe has always been within the hands of the countries um, and what we Green are defending right now is that we put in back uh, for real in the hands of the citizens, not only to vote on referendums uh, in the end to say if they agree or don't agree or the changes of the treaties which would be um, proposed, but even to design which kind of European Union we want. And so that we're pushing for citizens assemblies to be organized. We had some examples throughout the EU. In France, we have a climate citizen assembly that is uh, finalizing its work uh, and that is really more green than any government we had in the last you know, decades or centuries. Um, so when you gather people, 
probably they are more greens and more social than than even so social and left and you know green things in governments um but we also had other examples uh, in iceland for instance or local examples as well so we know how to do that we know how to gather citizens and to tell them where do you think the european union should go and they can answer that um and then of course we have our own proposals from the green family uh, to put forward in this discussion um I, I talked about an environmental treaty before i think at least for me it's the most important thing because it would allow um to organize all the rest the institutions the social policies but also the economy which is the most important thing to control um under environmental rules and environmental not just about the environment, they're about the rights of people, the rights of people to feed, to breathe, to drink water, um, to live in a decent house and decent environment. So it's also really social. Um, and, and that would be the main point. But then we have a lot of work to do on um, real solidarity, as I said. Uh, uh, we have a lot of you know, mechanisms to work on. We have, for instance, um, a European citizen initiative, but which is really difficult. And we had this big movement in France for the last year and a half, the Yellow Vest movement, which I'm sure everyone uh, heard about, that began because they were against an unjust tax carbon tax that weighed more on the poorest people, the one who pollute the least, and was really cheap for the biggest polluters. So they raised um, against this unjust environmental policy but not against ecology they raised against injust injustice injustice um, but really quickly their main revendication was about direct democracy and we can really feel like if we give the, the word the choice the decision back to the people um, in all our decisions then they can be more fair and more just it's a bit like i said uh, on the citizens assembly um, so I don't know where it will go. We have this fight right now going on to get the most citizens possible involved in the revision of the treaties. We need to revise the treaties on many different issues. We need to have the citizens deciding from the beginning. Um, and yeah, we're working in that direction. And I really hope that that will be um, indeed what the commission with and the council, of course, will, will launch. So we'll see in the coming weeks uh, what is decided. Um, but again, uh, let's give back control to the people. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so, Shreko, the last word is for you. Um, how do you now see the, the citizens uh, and citizen movements uh, rearranging European Union or building new institutions, as you said? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I'm all for citizen assemblies, but I'm not so optimistic or hopeful towards the Conference for the Future of Europe, uh, uh, because I think what you can see now is some, uh, it's a very similar situation. I don't know, uh, many Greens were part of the World Social Forum, right? Uh, 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 good old days of the World Social Forum. And at the same time, I remember when the, I think, was it in Tunisia or in Senegal? I'm not sure completely. At the same time, uh, you know, the Arab Spring was happening. Uh, 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 there was Occupy Wall Street. I think that's the one in Senegal, which happened in 2011. And you had Occupy Wall Street, Tahrir, and everything and so on. And you had 50,000 people in the World Social Forum, uh, uh, where, of course, there were many connections between these movements. Uh, but at the same time, you had an older institutional organization and you had so many new social movements which started to, to flourish even without direct connections. Uh, and I think we are in a kind of similar situation today where, you know, we can organize on the one hand uh, uh, citizens' assemblies, but at the same time, I think social movements are also very fast. Uh, uh, you, uh, you don't underestimate uh, the power of political subjectivation, which happens when uh, a few people uh, uh, tear down a statute uh, to, to a slave owner in Bristol. I mean, just look what's, what kind of domino effect it had. Uh, 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 and I think that's also something we have to take into consideration. You know, sometimes this small act can have a much bigger effect than, 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 than many other acts. 
And the question then, besides solidarity, is the question of organization. The, and I think that that's the crucial question, uh, how to organize this existing, uh, uh, I wouldn't call it spontaneous energy, because it's not spontaneous, it's, it's, it's a reaction to the structural violence of the system. Uh, and how do we organize it at the same time on a local level and on a planetary level? I think that's the big question ahead of us. Uh, and to try to rethink radically also the role of institutions. Uh, uh, besides being part of them, trying to get as much as we can out of them for the progressive cause, I think, yeah, it's time also to, and many people are doing it, many social movements already, to build new institutions. And when I say building new institutions, I don't think about building a new European Parliament. Uh, I'm talking about something much more than just that, yeah. Okay. I don't know whether that makes sense or not, but anyhow, I'm really grateful that we spent this hour together and hopefully next time in person. Okay, I want to thank you both for this very, I think, open conversation about, uh, let's say, a lot of things, uh, especially I think the analysis, there's a kind of agreement, but then also for how to react certain agreement on certain different points. But I think for me, this is the definition of a democracy. It's a kind of organized way of having different opinions. And so uh, I'm sure that after summer, we will come back on this topic, the future of the European Union. I want to thank both speakers and to the people watching us. If you appreciated this session, uh, there's a link in your chat box if you want to make a donation, which allows us to organize even more of these green post corona talks. And uh, I would also invite you for next week. We already have then the 10th session of the green post corona talks where young people will be giving the floor and they will uh, yeah, tell us how they experience the crisis, how they look at the future. So many thanks again for being with us Thank and you. hopefully we see each other next week again. Thanks to you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Yeah. We're not live anymore. No. Ah, okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Many thanks. I, I really found it very interesting. This kind of constitution.